And now we'll talk a little bit about what the book says, right? Because the whole point is why it matters, right? This is a book about you know why blockchain matters as opposed to just what it, what it does we get over with in one chapter. The rest of the book's about why. Many of my students are familiar with this statement. People buy solutions to problems, not simply technologies. When you are building your blockchain startup company or your blockchain project inside of a large organization, please remember what problem you are solving. Do you know what this is? Soybeans, correct. What does soybeans have to do with blockchain? Well, as I was working on this book, I, um, I had an opportunity to sit down with the former CEO of Moody Dreyfus Commodities, one of the largest manufacturers and distributors of soybeans in the world, and sugar, too. I mean, a lot of the food we eat, 80% of the, the consumables commodities market passes through Louis Dreyfus's hands. It's an enormous company. Um, so I had a chance to sit down with Serge Schoen, the, CEO, the former CEO, uh, and um, uh, so I flew into Geneva and I drove out to the foothills of the, uh, of the Alps uh, and, uh, and met with him in his house. And uh, you know, I was telling him a little bit about what I was working on and, and uh, about the book. And, and in fact, I had already written draft manuscript. And so, uh, and I had a very short amount of time to write it because uh, when the publisher, the publisher approached me in July of last year and said to me, we want you to do this book. I said, great, let's launch it right around Davos. Uh, and he said, fantastic, you need to turn in the manuscript October 1st. Um, and he said, well, actually, September 1st, because we need a month to edit it. Um, so I had about four weeks uh, to write this book, which was an interesting challenge, because I knew as soon as it was published, everyone would be looking to pick it apart. So I had to make sure it was actually good, too. Um, so I'm sitting there with the manuscript, and I'm, I'm in Serge's uh, uh, living room, you know, drinking down espresso after espresso, um, and he proceeds to tell me a little bit of uh, an interesting factoid because he got really excited when I told him I was working on a book on distributed ledger and blockchain. He said, you know, 60% of the cost of commodities companies, 60% of the expense line is back office paperwork. Food provenance, tariffs, customs, traceability. There's an immense amount of paperwork a large number of intermediaries, something ripe for blockchain. And in fact, lo and behold, Louis Dreyfus ran a pilot of DLT, and they managed to accelerate the time around a soybean transaction by 80%. That's money. All right, so. I will assert that the management of foodstuffs and commodities is a major use case area for blockchain in a major way that it can impact the food that lands on your table. If we cut 60% of the cost out of food production, imagine what that can do for people who maybe are of poor economic needs. Food gets cheaper. All right, shipping. This was another interesting one. I, so, so, funny story. Um, we go back to the origins of the class and MIT FinTech. Uh, you know, the, the, when I was organizing, when we were writing the syllabus, um, Melton was like, you need to make sure that you talk a lot about blockchain. And I said, what's a blockchain? And, you know, I, I'm being a little facetious, but I didn't know much about it. And I figured, all right, teaching this class will be good for me because it will force me to learn about blockchain. And the way it's going to do that is my students are going to teach me about it. Um, and that's exactly what happened. And so to this day, one of my greatest joys about teaching is I always learn something new and interesting from my students. Because I tend to provide broad frameworks and platforms, and my students work on something incredibly interesting and specialized and then tell me about it. And now I've learned something new. Well, lo and behold, 
we run something. So we set something up for people who have taken our, our online classes. A lot of people said, hey, we want to do, I want to keep moving with my idea. Can you help? We said, all right, we'll, we'll create this on-campus accelerator called Oxford FinTech Lab. So one of the students, uh, Anjan, uh, CEO of a company called Navazine, uh, showed up at Oxford FinTech Lab. And he said, guess what we're doing with blockchain? And I said, I have no idea. What are you doing with blockchain? And he said, well, my business partner is a ship captain. I'm like, oh, well, that's interesting. <laughs> Why is your business partner a ship captain? He said, when he brings his container ship into port, he gets a giant satchel of papers. And he walks down to the port captain's office, and he spends the next day going through all of the papers relating to that container ship. Same thing for the cruise ships. When the cruise ship docks at a port, they have to do all this paperwork and KYC on every single passenger on the ship. Tailor made for distributed ledger. So the International Maritime Organization, which is the UN's agency that governs international shipping and ports, 140 ports, I believe, are members. The IMO has teamed up with Navazine around their solution, which is trying to solve a lot of cost and inefficiency around shipping through distributed ledger. This is another real world impact, which is going to, if, if anything that you wear, buy, touch, or use is not made with your own hands or within you know, 20 kilometers of your home, it probably goes through a port. So every aspect of your life will be touched by the work that Navazine does through blockchain. Financial services was the first application of blockchain, right? Bitcoin. People didn't trust banks, so they started a new currency. Um, financial services industry has uh, flung themselves headlong into at least experimenting with blockchain um, because of the potential to eliminate most of the middle and back office and save on cost. There are some use cases that are scaling. Bitcoin is one of them. People ask me, has anything in blockchain scaled? I said, how's 150 billion for you? That's one. But there are others. I find Ripple really exciting. These guys you know, are trying to solve the fact that $10 trillion of liquidity in the world's financial markets are wrapped up in moving money between banks and across borders. SWIFT is very scared of Ripple. They won't frame it that way. They'll say, we're investing heavily in distributed ledger. But the reason that they're paying attention to that at all is because Ripple now has hundreds of banks that are using their solution. And they just raised, what was it, two or three hundred million dollars? Does anyone remember? That kind of money going into that kind of business indicates that it continues to build scale. And you know, I get really excited by not only what they can do for interbank transfer, but also the impact that they can support on everyday lives. So I have a former student, uh, uh, took one of my on-campus classes, uh, David Lighton. Um, he's the CEO of a company called Sendfrit. And they're a consumer peer-to-peer -peer payments company that uses the Ripple Rail as their back end to move money for remittances cross-border very inexpensively. This is a passion project of mine. There were Bitcoin companies as well, BitPesa is an example, that are playing in this space. Circle did some work in this area. But basically, you know, in Africa, for example, it used to be that if you wanted to wire money, let's say uh, you are from Kenya or Rwanda, and you came to Germany to get a job uh, to make money to send home to Rwanda, um, it would cost you 15% to send that money. 15% of your transactions send that money. Now, as you can tell from my accent, I'm from the United States. When I'm in the U.S. and I want to send money to someone else in the U.S., it costs me about 25 cents. That's it. It's not a percentage of the transactions. It's 25 cents to send an ACH transfer versus 15% of the transaction value if you are from a poor country and you're an immigrant. Something economists call the poor tax. Poor people pay more for the same goods and services as wealthier people. With blockchain, with distributed ledger, with things like Bitcoin Rail or Ripple Rail or Ethereum Rail, 
We can now move money for less than 1%. At one point, Jeremy Allaire, the, the CEO of Circle, said to me, you know, I, um, I think I'm just going to give away the source code for my consumer payments blockchain platform because I can't make money on consumer. The, the, the fee you can charge is going to zero. Interesting idea. But the potential for transformation and to, to better the lives of you know, the three and a half billion people in the world who are today underserved by the financial services industry is really profound. So there's another real world impact, real use case where there's real scale for blockchain. Health is an example of something that I would call more aspirational. It's not yet, but it's coming. And it's a $5 trillion a year industry. There's going to be real impact for people, not only in monetary sense, but also in terms of, of better lives, of living life. So one major source of medical error, of fatalities in the healthcare system globally, is, is at the points of what are called transitions in care. When you go from the ambulance into the emergency department, if you go from the emergency department to the intensive care unit, you go from the intensive care unit to the x-ray radiology unit. Those are all transitions in care. And every time the patient is handed off from one team of medical providers to another team of medical providers, information about that patient has to be passed along. And even with electronic medical records, it still gets screwed up. The patient data is not as portable as you want it to be. It's not flowing properly. It's not propagating properly. And what's worse is, if you try and then go to another care system, like let's say you were being treated by the NHS and then for whatever reason you then went to a doctor uh, with BUPA, the, the systems aren't great at talking to each other, the technology systems. Good luck getting your medical record to flow smoothly with you. It's even worse in the U.S. And partly that's because the companies that built the electronic medical record systems deliberately made them not able to talk to each other because they were trying to make more money by forcing you to stay with their system. That's bad for patients. So patient data portability is something that blockchain has the potential to solve, and people are working on that. Another area that I find very exciting is on clinical research. So there's a lot of dark data in clinical research. Drug companies spend about $5 billion US, so call it roughly 4 billion pounds, to bring a new drug to market. 80% of that is the cost of failures. Drug trials that they attempt that don't quite work out because they work on a portfolio. They don't publish the data on the drugs that fail. They only publish the data on the drugs that work. So for each drug that gets into the market, there's $4 billion worth of data that you can't see. It's held with inside one drug company. Blockchain and some other clever technology holds the potential to allow the pharmaceutical industry to share some of that dark data without leaking competitive information. And done properly, um, so if you want the technical terms, this is combining uh, secure multi-party computation with secret sharing, which is the technology side, the blockchain side, with something known as adaptive clinical trials. If you combine those two concepts, I'm not going to go into detail on what they are, you can cut the cost of drug development in half and the time to bring a new drug to market from 15 years to 7 years. Life-saving drugs can now come to market faster using DLT in combination with other business processes and technologies. So although it's aspirational, I find it exciting that humble blockchain may help save millions of lives someday. And that gets me thinking about the future. And one thing I tried to do with this book is not only make it for the average business person or the average politician or the average whoever who's trying to understand blockchain is like, Kind of heard of it, but I don't really know what it is. And that is definitely the audience. But also, 
for people who are working on blockchain, for people who are working in blockchain, I wanted to offer some provocations. I am confident, even if you're an expert on DLT, there will be things in this book that will pique your interest and provoke your imagination. Particularly the last three chapters, where I start spanning from the world of today to the world of tomorrow. And I start talking about what could happen to the, our educational systems if, forget the, so the easy thing is certification. So anyone who took the class has a little blockchain certificate that verifies that they took Oxford blockchain strategy. But beyond that, what if we actually organize educational institutions differently and use distributed ledger, use blockchain as a mediator for that? What if we organize government and society differently? We've got a lot of controversy back where I come from uh, around things like vote counting. Mm -hmm. So we had something uh, the other night called the Iowa caucuses. So the beginning of the cycle that decides on who will oppose Donald Trump in the general election in November um, is, is something called the caucus, which is different than the primary, but it's a way of figuring, you know, voting for who, who your favorite candidate is. Uh, and their entire vote counting system fell apart. The technology broke. And then someone, to compound matters, they, they were doing a news report on it, and, and the news camera happened to flash on someone's papers on the table that had the phone number that was the hotline to call with the vote tallies. And so all of the Trump supporters immediately started calling that number and engaging in a massive denial of service attack so that the votes couldn't be counted. Um, so that's going on back uh, where I come from. And so a lot of people have said, hey, we can use blockchain to count votes transparently, better, securely. Um, and so that's interesting. And, you know, I talk about some of the negative issues that arise from that, but also the positive ones. But we can go beyond that. Blockchain is interesting ways of organizing people to make decisions. It can help with organizations. It can also help with how we govern society. And then I go even beyond that, but I'll save the last chapter for those of you who buy the book. <laughs> you can read about it. So, um, basic blockchain is available on Amazon uh, as long as you're not in the U.S. North America, uh, you can get Kindle, but the paper version is it's only available in the fall. Um, you can find some more of my thoughts and, and books at visionaryfuture.com and that's my email if you have follow-up questions or, you know, just want to say hello. And certainly I'm on LinkedIn. So, look, I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to me share a few thoughts about blockchain and, and, and book and what I have to say about it. Um, and, you know, I look forward to your questions and, and to the conversation with the other panelists. So thank you very much.